up the other day talking about you know, different sources of authority, um, you know, and what's a primary authority versus what's a secondary authority. Um, you know, we said our primary authority is really what you can go into court with. It's something you can go into an IRS appeal with. Um, you don't want to go in and say it's a secondary authority, okay? If you're going to take a position, you want to make sure you're taking it based on the right type of materials. And there's very limited primary um, authority out there that you want to be using. Um, so that's the first thing is understanding what's primary versus what is secondary. And we're starting now to talk about what is primary. If we don't talk about it, it is not a primary source of authority, okay? We said the obvious things like Google, Wikipedia, those are obviously not primary authority. Your textbook is not primary authority. IRS forms, IRS publications, those very detailed publications that they tell you exactly how to calculate and report your tax on your return, those are not primary sources of authority, okay? Only the things that we're going to go through in detail are primary sources of authority, and these are the things that you want to be looking for. Um, so we started out by saying, look, your primary sources of authority come from all three branches of our government, okay? Some comes from the legislative branch, some comes from our executive branch, and some comes from our judicial branch. We started off last week by talking about the sources of primary authority that come from the legislative branch, okay? Our Congress is, you know, first and foremost responsible for the Constitution. But for our purposes, we said there's really not a whole lot of tax information in the Constitution apart from the 16th Amendment. Um, so for what we're doing, we're not really looking too much to the Constitution. Um, we said they also are responsible for tax treaties. Tax treaties are a very important source of primary authority. But again, unless you're dealing in, in the international arena, for our purposes, they're not really going to serve as a very big purpose, okay? For us, the biggest piece of authority issued by the legislature is the Internal Revenue Code, okay? This is by far, for our purposes, what we're looking for. And the Internal Revenue Code, in my opinion, is the single most authoritative piece of authority. Um, this is really what we're looking for. You know, the book says that, you know, they put the Supreme Court and the Internal Revenue Code kind of neck and neck. Uh, in weight of authority, but I would say I would knock the Supreme Court down just a bit because, again, you know, only Congress is responsible for issuing the law. Supreme Court cannot issue the law. They can declare it unconstitutional, um, but if they don't, they have to respect it, and all they're allowed to do really is to interpret it. So, in my opinion, the Internal Revenue Code is by far, you know, your single most authoritative piece of authority if you're going into a tax appeal of some sort. Okay. Um, you know, we talked about the process, uh, or the, I should say the book talked about the process of how, you know, a bill becomes a law. Again, it's interesting, but, you know, we're not really going to go through it. Um, it's not just for tax, it's for any sort of bill. Um, the only new I made of that is that as the bill kind of works its way through the House, through the Senate, through the Joint um, Commerce Committee, uh, there's all these committee notes that come out, and this is where the bill is being debated on the floor. You know about what they're trying to achieve and what they want this code to look like and who they're trying to you know get involved in this code and what the target audience should be those are very very important notes they are really good pieces of authority you'll see if you ever go to grad school you study a lot of court cases and what you start to see when you start looking at these court cases is that the courts constantly go back to these committee notes saying the code is i don't want to use the word vague but it's broad um, and it doesn't always tell them what they want to know by just reading it literally. So a lot of times they go back to these committee notes to say, what was Congress getting at? Like, who were they trying to capture with this code? You know, what, what target audience were they going after? What were they really trying to achieve? And these committee notes are a great, great, great tool for that. And you see it a lot when you start reading court cases. So just know that that is an important byproduct of that process. Um, and then we, you know, kind of skimmed over the structure of the code, which I don't think for this class is all that important because we are not actually reading the code. You guys don't have a code book, so for us, it's not really all that important. Um, so the next uh, part of our government that provides us with a primary authority is our um, executive slash, I'll call it administrative branch, okay guys? The Treasury Department is an administrative branch, uh, an administrative department within the government. <coughs> Over time, these administrative departments have become very, very large and very, very powerful. So, you know, we used to refer to the three branches of government, um, you know, executive, legislative, and judicial. But nowadays, a lot of times, you might hear people call this your, almost your fourth branch of government, um, or they 
to throw it into the executive branch, uh, which we're doing here. Uh, so you have a Treasury Department, and just so you guys understand, the IRS is a bureau within the Treasury Department, okay? It's not technically the Treasury Department, the IRS falls underneath the Treasury Department, though. Um, okay? And the Treasury Department um, issues several different types of authority. And again, there's a chart in the book that you can look at, just it kind of summarizes it. You don't need to memorize it, though. Um, and really, it starts with the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department is delegated with the task of interpreting the code issued by Congress, okay? So Congress comes out with the code, and then the Treasury Department is tasked with interpreting it. What does Congress mean, okay? Um, and what you'll find, I showed you guys the other day, that code book is generally for almost every code issued by Congress, you will find a corresponding regulation, okay? And the regulation takes that code, and they go into much more detail much more detail. They will go so far in a lot of cases to actually include actual examples of if you are in this situation, here is how you calculate that. Here is how you apply that tax. Okay? It's not uncommon to have one page of code and 200 pages of regulations for that one little code. Um, okay, so the regs go into a lot more detail and they are issued by the Treasury Department. Um, regs come in three forms. Okay? Uh, all regs are initially issued as proposed regulations. And this basically means they're open to a period of public comment. You'll get lobbies, you'll get lawyers, you'll get tax accountants, you'll get businesses who are interested or going to be affected by this regulation. Um, and they will literally write in and say, well, have you considered this? Or what does it mean for this? Or, you know, their sort of thoughts on the process. And then what happens is they pull all of this information in, uh, the Treasury Department, they look at it, they weigh it, you know, are there some important points in here? Have we forgotten something? Have, you know, is this really not so important? This is really a self-serving letter. Um, and they decide what to do. Are we going to reissue this again, propose, maybe with some of these changes that, you know, have been requested here? Or are we comfortable with what we're issuing and now we're going to issue it for good? Um, it's part of the process. But every single regulation goes out in proposed format first. Um, some regulations are issued on a temporary basis. They're given a three-year life. If they're not final and active, they will expire after three years. Um, and then you have your final regulations, which obviously have gone through their public comment period, and now they have been fully implemented. Um, you would think temporary would be less in weight than a final, but they're not. They're equal in weight. Okay, So if you have a temporary regulation, it's just as good as a final issue regulation. The proposed, a little bit less so. Are there temporary regulations that are like still, because in the book it just says like after November 20th, were there ones before that that could have lasted longer or something? Um, I think there actually are proposed regulations that have stayed open for like a long time. I don't, I couldn't tell you honestly offhand what the process is for determining how long something stays open versus when it gets closed. There's, I don't think there's a set like hard and fast rule. It, you know, it's open for you know two years and then we decide what to do with it. Um, but they shouldn't be out there forever. I mean, eventually they should be sort of pulled back or you know canceled or issued as final. So those are the forms. Um, there are also three different types of regulations, okay? By far, the most common is gonna be what's called an interpretive regulation, and it's exactly what we've been talking about. The Treasury Department has taken that newly issued code, and they have expanded upon it. They maybe included some examples, okay? They're taking the broad sort of base statement, and they're gonna give you all the details behind it. Again, keep in mind, Congress, guys, for the most part, these aren't business people. Not all of them, anyway. A lot of them aren't. Um, they know what they're trying to achieve, but the Treasury Department, now you have your business people, okay? They have a lot more experience. They have a better handle of what's going on with taxpayers and what they're interested in and what sort of transactions are going out there. So they're able to kind of fill in a lot of the detail that Congress isn't going to do at that broad level. Um, so that's the interpretive regulations. There are procedural regulations. These There are a fair amount of these, but they're not as common. This is really um, the Treasury Department's administration of the code. Um, how do you calculate a penalty? How do you go about collecting a tax? So it's really more how are they administering the code if, you know, and they're dealing with the taxpayers. Um, and then the last one are called legislative regulations. These are very uncommon. This is essentially where Congress is taking their rulemaking authority and delegating it down to the Treasury Department. Um, so there may not be a code in this case. Okay. They're just going to issue what's called a legislative regulation, and this is 
essentially is the law now instead of the code. Um, so this is legislative regulation, which are very uncommon, um, would be higher in authority than the other types of regulations because it is the law. It's not an interpretation of an existing code section. Um, I think the book refers to this. Look, I'm just going to tell you, if you find a regulation, you know, you're a tax practitioner, you're an attorney, and you're doing some work for a client, um, regulations are extremely authoritative. They're not as good as the code, but if you find a regulation on point, you're in really good shape. Um, and there's a court case, and I think the book refers to it, called um, the, Mayo, uh, the Mayo Plan. Um, and it's not an interesting case so much because of the tax proposition in the case, but because of what Chief, Chief Justice Roberts said in the course of deciding the case is that, um, you know, the, the courts are going to do everything they can to uphold the regulation. They realize that Congress has delegated the job of interpreting the code to the Treasury Department, and the Treasury Department are, you know, these are business people, they understand what's going on. So the courts see it as their job to uphold these regulations however they can, unless they're going to find that these rules are sort of arbitrary and capricious. Then they may not uphold them, but for the most part, if you have a regulation, you're in really good shape. It's really good primary authority, okay? Um, okay, moving on. Uh, also coming out of this administrative branch are what are called revenue rulings and revenue procedures. They're sort of the same thing, um, slightly different. Okay. Now, these are issued by the IRS. They're not coming from the Treasury Department. Okay? Regs come from Treasury. Everything else we're about to talk about is coming from the IRS now. A little bit different. Okay? Um, <coughs> revenue rulings, guys, they take specific factual situations and they talk, they discuss them in more detail. So, you know, taxpayers in general are having a hard time determining when they're allowed to take a mileage allowance. You know, I'm commuting from my house to my first office, I'm going to my second job, you know, what am I allowed to do? Right? So they're going to take a very specific situation and talk about it in detail. That's what a revenue ruling is. Um, these revenue rulings are binding on the IRS. So if you are in appeal with the IRS and you find a revenue ruling that's right on point, you're in great shape. They have to respect it. Okay? Um, here's the trick though. Okay? The courts don't have to follow them. So they're great authority if you're in an appeal or an audit with the IRS. Not so great if you're going into court, because the courts can overrule them. They don't have to respect that uh, revenue ruling. Uh, revenue procedures, guys, kind of just like the procedural regulations for, again, dealing with the, it's the IRS's administration of the code. Um, so they may take specific situations of, you know, you have a certain taxpayer, he paid his taxes late, he filed for an extension, how do we calculate the failure to file tax? It's, it's really dealing, again, with things like, you know, applying penalty, collecting taxes, administrative sort of things. They're the kind of partner of the revenue rulings, but they really deal to IRS's application of the administrative, administrative side of dealing with the code. Okay. Also coming from the IRS are what are called letter rules. Okay, and there's a bunch of different types of letter rulings. Here what's happening is they're taking a very specific factual situation, but they're addressing it to a very specific taxpayer. Okay? It's not just a nameless, faceless taxpayer now. This letter is being written to someone about a very specific problem that you know they were trying to figure out how to handle. Okay. That taxpayer can rely on this as primary authority. So if they have to go into, you know, they're probably actually already in an appeal or an audit of some sort. Um, so it could be relied on by that taxpayer as primary authority, but no other taxpayer can cite it as authority. Okay, so if you're going into an audit, you're going into court, you're not going to want to rely, to rely on this. What you can use it for, though, is to get out of the penalty. Okay, so you may go into, let's just say, um, <coughs> An audit, and you may present this, and the IRS may say, "Sorry, that was to you know Joe Smith. You can't use that. So we're still going to assess that tax, uh, that extra tax that we're saying you owe. But what they can't do is charge you a penalty on that extra assessment. Okay? You may be out the extra tax dollars. You may lose your case and have to owe the extra money. But they're not going to at least slap you with the extra penalty on top of it if you have one of these letter forms. They'll help you with that." 
Okay, there's a couple of different types. The first one is what's called a private letter drawing. Okay. These are issued for prospective transactions, transactions that haven't yet been completed. Okay. These are issued generally for significant prospective transactions. Things like, you know, we're going to engage in an initial public offering. We're going to go through a merger acquisition. You know, we're going to spin a division out. Okay, big things. The reason why these are for big things, guys, these are not cheap. The last time I looked, these cost somewhere between like the numbers I saw were $2,000 and $19,000, right? To get one of these private letter rulings, it's requested by you, the taxpayer. Taxpayer, you're saying, I want to engage in this transaction. Here's what I'm proposing to do. And basically, what you're doing is you're buying yourself a guaranteed treatment from the IRS. Here's how I'm establishing this transaction. This is what we're anticipating the tax treatment is going to be. Is this correct? Okay, you're going to get back a sort of not a yes or no answer. I mean, they may not necessarily agree with what you're doing. Um, they may say, well, here's what's going to happen. Um, but you're basically buying yourself insurance of this transaction is going to be handled a certain way, and you'll know what the outcome is going to be if you do go into an audit. Okay, so this two to nineteen thousand dollars, that's just what you're paying the IRS. That's not counting what you're paying your tax accountants, what you're paying your attorneys. So these things again are for big transactions. It's a lot of money involved. And it generally takes somewhere between like four and six months to get one. So it's a lengthy process. By the time your attorneys write it, you know, everyone does what you need to do on your end, it goes to IRS and then it comes back, you know, you're probably talking about close to a year sometimes. Um, so these are sort of big deal transactions. Um, on a smaller scale, there's the determination letters. Similar in that these again are being requested by you, the taxpayer. But these are for more routine matters, okay? Again, it's a prospective transaction haven't done it yet. Something like, you know, my company is setting up a pension plan. Uh, you know, here's what we're doing. Will it qualify? Okay. If you're just looking for more simple transactions. And these are done at a local level. Okay. The local um, IRS directors are going to issue these determination letters to you, the taxpayer. And then the last one the book brings up, there's actually lots of different ones of these. The last one the book addresses, though, are what are called technical advice memorandums. Okay. These are not requested by you. These generally come about as, you know, you're in the middle of an audit, it's probably something of a technical, complicated audit, and their IRS person on site isn't even really sure what to do. This is complicated, this is involved. So what they're gonna do is they're now gonna request this technical advice memorandum from the team in Washington. There's lawyers in Washington, they turn to them, explain the situation, and then they'll come back with saying, this is how things should be done, okay? So it's issued at the request generally of an IRS auditor, examination officer, appeals auditor, whomever it is, and it'll come back with advice saying, here's how you should, you know, report this. The IRS also issues what are called acquiescence and non-acquiescence, okay? This is basically the IRS goes to court and they lose, okay? They go to court now and they lose, and they can issue an acquiescence or a non-acquiescence. And acquiescence says, look, we don't necessarily agree with the outcome here, but we're going to respect it, okay, and we're not going to fight it. We're going to let this sort of thing go. We're not going to pursue this any further. They could also issue, though, a non-acquiescence and say, we don't agree with the outcome, and we are going to keep pursuing this. We're going to pursue this in audits. We're going to pursue this in court. We don't agree with the outcome, okay? And then the book mentioned the action on decisions. The action on decisions, really, guys, are just explaining the rationale for why they're either acquiescing or non-acquiescing in other cases. And these are great, these acquiescence and non-acquiescence are great in kind of figuring out the trickiness of the position you may be thinking about taking, because it's kind of showing you the mindset of the IRS. Like, you know what, we've lost, we're letting it go now. So if you're ready to take that position, you might be in a decent shape, because they're saying, look, we're not gonna appeal this anymore, we're not gonna fight it. You know, on the other hand, if they're saying, look, we're not gonna acquiesce, we're gonna keep going after this, and you're about to take that position, well, then you may be still up for audit, okay? Um, so it's just showing you a little bit about what's going on in the mind of the IRS. Um, so these are all the things, you know, there's much more in reality, but these are all the things that the book is addressing as coming as primary authority. There's a little bit of tricks in there, right? It may be primary authority under the eyes of the IRS, maybe not so much in the eyes of the court, though, okay? Some of these things the IRS will respect, the courts won't. Um, so, you know, know those kind of little nuances. Um, and then really, guys, the last piece of primary authority comes out of our court systems. Um, and this is really, look, this is a matter of everything we've just gone through. You know, you have a taxpayer, you've gone into an audit, you know, you're debating this position with the IRS, I'm right, they're saying, no, you're wrong, okay? Um, they're saying, nope, at the end of the day, we've gone through our process, you still owe us money, now you owe us penalty, 
is now U.S. interest, and you're saying, no, I want an independent party to look at this. So you go to court, okay? Now the courts are stepping in, and they're basically ruling on it. Um, despite all this primary authority we've just listed, you guys still can't come to terms, so now the courts are going to decide who's right, who's wrong. They're going to read all the law, they're going to look at these uh, regulations, these revenue rulings, etc., and decide who's going to win the case. And their rulings, become primary authority themselves, so that the next time this goes to court, well, that previous court case is now authority. And now the courts come up back and say, oh, we've already looked at this case before, so this piece of authority in place, it's a primary piece of authority, that's how we're gonna rule. We looked at this, it's done, okay? Um, that's how this comes about. Obviously, Supreme Court is gonna be sort of top of the heat. If Supreme Court rules on something, you've got a great piece of primary authority. It's almost as good as your internal revenue code, okay? Um, courts of appeal are gonna be next. And then at the bottom in authority, you're gonna have your three trial level courts, and they actually have the rankings. You're gonna have your tax court first, right? Because we know that the tax court is made up of tax experts, and all they do is hear tax court cases. So they have more um, knowledge of the tax law than the other lower courts. So they're going to be the highest of those three, okay? The Federal Court of Claims is going to be second because they only hear a certain type of case. They only hear cases regarding monetary claims against the U.S., meaning you're someone suing for a refund. You're suing to get money back. They only hear cases in those situations. At the bottom is going to be the district court, okay? Because they're generalists. They hear all different types of court cases, not just tax court cases and not just, you know, refund cases. So you're your Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and you have your tax court, Federal Court of Claims, and then your district courts are going to be the least authoritative in nature. Professor? Yeah. Who votes in the people into the tax court? To the tax court? Uh, I don't know if those are appointments. I don't know if those are voted in. Certain courts are appointments, certain courts are, are voting. I, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I'd be making it up if I can okay. do it. I can look it up though. Yeah, that's I feel like those may be appointments. I don't I guess they, they have to have a very high level of tax expertise, right? Yeah, which is why I don't know that's a voting sort of thing. I feel like that may be by like some sort of And point. there's only one court, right? No, no, no. no tax court. court is national. There's a bunch national. of them. Like the one that we would appeal to here in um, New Jersey is actually held in New York. You would go into New York as a tax court there. Okay. Which actually brings me to the next part. Um, so look, like within the courts, guys, so that you know every court isn't doing its own thing and it's not all like the Wild West and, you know, the... East Coast is doing one thing and the West Coast is doing another and everyone doesn't set up their own little sort of fight thumbs. There's a couple of rules in place, right? The first one is called uh, the Doctrine of Star to CC. And what this means is first and foremost that, you know, a court is going to respect its own rulings. You know, I ruled previously on a case with similar fact patterns, therefore I have to rule the same way again. Unless, you know, there was a subsequent change in law or, you know, over time some judges leave, you get new judges, they may eventually rule, you know what, there was a mistake in that case, or you know, they didn't look at this using the right set of facts. In those cases, they can overturn their previous rulings, but for the most part, if they've already ruled, they've got to follow that rule again, okay? Um, and it goes on to say, not only do they have to follow their own rulings, but they have to follow the rulings of the courts that they appeal up to. Um, they always have to look up to the courts above them to see how did they rule. Um, if the court above them ruled you know, on a case, they have to respect that. It's automatic. They can't go against their appeal court. Okay? That's the uh, doctrine of star CC. Uh, and then there's also what is called the Wilson Rule. Okay? So using the tax court as an example, you might have, like, there's the New York tax court, um, and they may hear, you know, cases from New York, New Jersey, uh, wherever. Well, the rule says that when you appeal, it's based on residence. So, as New Jersey residents, if we wanted to appeal after we were heard by the New York tax court, we have to appeal to the third court of appeal. You guys don't need to know these. I'm not going to ask you specific numbers. Um, so as New Jersey residents, that's where we have to appeal to. Okay? Even though we were heard in New York by the New York tax court, we're going to appeal to the third court of appeals. If you have a New York resident, though, okay, they're going to appeal to the second court of appeals. And again, it's by residence. You just, that's just how you appeal. So you might have this tax court, and they may hear two tax cases. Let's just say it's not going to happen, but identical uh, situation, identical facts. But when they go to appeal, they're appealing to two different courts of appeal. And this court of appeal may look at this case one way. They might have had prior rulings one way. And this court of appeal might look at it a different way. They might go the opposite direction. And so even though we 
just said that a court has to follow their own rulings. In this particular case called the Golson Rule, they have to look up to their courts of appeal. And they have to respect what these two courts said. So they might hear you know, two cases exactly the same, but they might end up with two very different rulings based on the courts of appeal, okay? That's the, the Golson Rule. So that, to an extent, is overriding that uh, doctrine of start to cease it in this particular situation. We've got two, two trials, exact same facts, but because of their residence and where they're appealing, the outcomes may be different because they, the tax court, have to look to these guys, the courts of appeal, to figure out what their rulings were. And this court may rule yes, and this court may rule no. So, again, they're going to go that way. What did you say this one is called? The Golson Rule. Systems is 
really in the fact that they link all of this information together. So you might be in a code section and it will link you directly to the regulation you're looking for. And then the regulation may give you a list of court cases that have sort of discussed this regulation in depth. So then you can go right to maybe a court case. And you kind of can move around the system bouncing here and there. <coughs> it really helps you. If you're looking for a particular point, it really helps you zone in on exactly what you're looking for to the point you can find particular court cases, revenue rulings, right? The revenue rulings will bring you back to a court case. The court case will bring you back to the code. Um, it's this crazy complex system, but it's fantastic for getting you where you want to go. Um, so the book kind of walks us through, guys, these five stages of doing tax research. I mean, the first one really is, you know, it says understanding the facts. I mean, this is really, the client comes in and you're trying to figure out what, do, what needs to be done here. Either what point am I helping bail you out of? What did you do that we're now trying to justify that you did? Or I have a unique tax situation. How do I handle that in my return? So this is really your fact gathering stage. You're gonna sit down with your client. You're gonna talk to your client, get as much information as you can. You may ask to talk to third parties. Maybe they engage in a transaction with someone else. Maybe you ask to talk to that party. You're gonna look at documents, contracts, invoices, whatever is gonna give you information about what you're trying to address, okay? That's really the first step. Um, the only thing I will advise there is, you know, when you're doing research also, if you're meeting with a client, is you should always understand the tax hire, first of all, is not a tax expert, so they may not know exactly what they're saying or not saying. They may be calling something a deduction. It's not a deduction, okay? Just honest, you know, and experience. Also, um, you should always realize when you're dealing with a client that they may have a bias, okay? They may be trying to tell you what you want to hear, not necessarily what you need to hear. And you should also always be keeping that in mind as well when you're in this early sort of fact gathering stage. Um, the second step is called, you know, it's identifying the issues. And this is really where your tax experience comes in, okay? They brought me this sort of problem, I'm not sure what to do with it, how do I handle it, okay? This is really where you're saying, what's at issue here? What question is it that this client needs answering for me? Is it, you know, are we trying to figure out if something deductible? Are we trying to figure out if something should not be included on the return, or should be included on the return? Is it a non-exchange, uh, you know, non-recognition transaction? What What is it we're trying to achieve here? And this really comes down to your experience, okay? Um, the third part, when you're actually getting into the system, is locating the authority, okay? So if we've been through the process, hopefully now you guys know what the authority you're looking for is, right? We're looking for primary authority. Um, and you're gonna use these systems to now locate the authority. The book talks about there's two ways to do this. I'm not convinced that that really matters, because the fact is, is look, you have experience, you know what your starting point is going to be. If you're dealing with corporate, you know, issues, you're going to go target, you know, uh, subsection, uh, subchapter C. If you're inexperienced, these tools are wonderful because you can actually go in and search by keywords. So, you know, they may ask you, oh, can I take a deduction on my daughter's ice skating lessons? You know, she's going professional, and this is really, you know, her trade. So, you know, you can actually go in. You don't want to put in just a word like deduction because you're going to get like, you know, five million hits. But if you put in deduction, uh, ice skating or deduction, uh, professional training, you know, you start to figure out how to go about this. It reduces the amount of material that's going to come back at you that you have to fish through now. Um, it may come up with court cases again. It may come up with revenue rulings, you know, for previous, you'd be surprised what's out there actually. And again, that's where you get your starting point. So, you know, using the research system, again, is really a function of your experience. Um, the most important part, in my opinion, really, is this fourth step, which is analyzing the authority and developing your conclusion, okay? So, you go into the system, you're gonna find, hopefully, a bunch of information. Okay, now you have to fish through this information. You don't want to say, oh, look, I found all this information, what do I do with it now, okay? There's a bunch of things you have to look for. First of all, you want to see, was it for my position or against my position? If you're finding all stuff that's against your position, okay, maybe it's time to back down and say, I don't really know that we should do this on this tax return, right? Um, but if you're finding stuff for your, for your position, that's a great thing. At what level? Now you're looking at the hierarchy, which we just talked about. Is it a code? Is it a regulation? Is it a revenue ruling? Is it court cases? Who issued the court case? Is it, you know, uh, being issued by a district court or was it issued by a court of appeal? Was that court in my uh, jurisdiction, okay? Or were they out of my jurisdiction? 
you have to start looking at all these different pieces of information and weighing it. And it's not a precise process, guys. There's no exact weight to each of these things. It's really up to you and your experience. Um, you also don't want to just be looking at, you know, who is this unit? How old is it? You know, is it was it one court case from, you know, 1921 and this has never been heard again? Okay, it's in your favor, but it's probably not the strongest piece of authority out there, right? Um, these are all little things you have to start looking at. Um, there is a great tool within these research systems. It's called a citator. Um, and what it will do is um, maybe you found a court case that's exactly on point. This is exactly what you're looking for. Well, you can hit this citator button, and it'll tell you how many times did other courts cite this particular court case and within their court cases. What you'll see, again, if you ever study this in depth, when you start reading court cases, is that courts don't like to be novel. They just want to look and see, well, other courts have already ruled on this, so they will just start citing the decisions and the findings of those courts within their own court cases. You'll just see one court case after another. They just keep referring to them. So the citator will tell you how many other courts refer to this case, and did they refer to them in a good way, meaning they supported the position, or did they go the other way? Because then it's not so good. So you always want to check the citator to make sure that, you know, was this a referred to case, and was it referred to in a good way? You know, if you cite a court case and then it comes to find out, oh, but they use this as a, an example of what not to do, probably then you just missed a big step and that's not a good piece of authority to use. Um, okay, the point being, guys, look, you have to go in, you have to collect all of your authority, you have to look and see, you know, the age of it, you have to weigh it, put it in the good column, the bad column, and then you kind of determine, okay, I think I have enough positive, good primary authority on my side that I can justify my client taking you know, X position on this return. Or I feel comfortable going into court and saying, look, I have all of this authority in my favor coming you know, from here, 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 and here. You know, we'll be okay, we'll be able to defend this position in a court you know, against the IRS. Um, this is, you know, again, this is really based on judgment, decision, and experience. Um, the last part, guys, is really to show how you communicate these things. And there is a proper way of doing it. Um, and there's two different communications that go out. One is internal and one is external. Obviously, the internal one, you're writing for your boss, you're writing for the files. Um, it's going to be much more technical. And it is done for the most part in this format, although you can make some changes to it. Um, they generally all follow the same sort of pattern. Look, you always start off with the facts. You restate the facts as presented to you by your client. And this is really done so that there's no misunderstanding. This is what you told me, okay? This is now a document of this is what you told me. <coughs> so there's just no misunderstanding of, you know, oh, that's not what I said, okay? Then you go on and you cite the issue at hand. This is the question I answered for you based on what you told me. This is what you're asking for. You want to know if this is deductible, okay? And you basically, you put it in the memo as in the form of a question. This is the question I'm answering. Then you state your conclusion. You don't have to, I mean, the book puts the authorities, you know, as a separate section. Generally, that's done within the content of the analysis. I personally wouldn't do that. Um, I would go straight to the conclusion at this point. So if you're answering multiple questions, you're gonna have multiple conclusions, okay? If you have three questions, you're having three conclusions. These should be short and concise. Here's what we're gonna do. You know, here's the recommendation. You should take this as a deduction. You should not take this as a deduction. Um, and then in the analysis, okay? This is where I personally would include the authority. And it's gonna be, a, you know, you're gonna walk through your starting point to your finishing point. I started here, this code section says this, but there is an exception, you know, so we went to code section this. You know, and then we found this court case that said this, you know, you kind of roll with it from there and you include the authority as you're going through. Um, when you're doing this for a client, obviously you're not gonna be so technical, it's gonna be a little more soft, you're not going to use all these terms, you don't have to get crazy citing your authority. But again, you want to be clear in stating your facts, because this is you reciting the facts as they were presented to you. You want to state, here's the question I had answered for you. Um, you kind of get into the authority, but not as technical with it, I would say. Um, and here's my recommendation to you. What I will say also is this is not a linear process. You don't just go into the system. You don't just sit down with your client, get the facts, write up your own question, do some research. It's a cyclical process. As you're doing research, you may come up with more questions. You may have to go back to the client, get some more facts. Then you're gonna go back in, 
you may come up with yet more questions. It's not a you know straightforward. You do this, you do this, you do this, and then you come up with a conclusion. Okay, you may keep going through some of these deals before you finally come out with your communication and conclusion. Um, that, in my opinion, is what we'll cover for tax research because again, I just it's hard to do it until you have more experience. So we'll leave it at that. Um, the last part of the book, guys, gets into tax professional responsibilities. Okay, and this is, you know, essentially how do they hold us, the tax practitioner, accountable for our actions and what we're doing and what we're doing for our clients. Mm. And the book mentions four or five methods. I'm going to add a six. So, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways that we are held accountable for what we do. Um, the first one they mention is the AICPA code of conduct. Okay. And this is really sort of a professional behavioral standard sort of thing, what you would expect, and we'll talk about it in a second. They also mention these AICPA, the Statements of Standards on Tax Services, the SSTSs. There's seven of them, and we'll them. Okay. There's your state board. Okay. Every state has its own state board. And when you guys go to apply for your CPA licenses, if you do, um, you will eventually have to go to the state board. Um, then there's the IRS. And there's two parts to the IRS. They have what is called Circular 230. Okay. And Circular 230 deals really with who can practice before the IRS and what the rules for doing so are. Um, then, separate from that, is there's certain penalties within the Internal Revenue Code themselves okay, that you will be held accountable under. And what I will throw in that the book doesn't mention is, guys, look, you were always going to be subject to malpractice. And that's probably one of the ones that people fear the most um, because that's where the big dollars come in. Okay? If you are sued for malpractice, you're in serious trouble. Um, and it does happen. Obviously, you buy insurance for this, but it's not a good thing. Because a lot of times, if you know you get sued for malpractice, you may in fact lose your insurance and have a hard time operating after that. Um, so I'm surprised they don't actually address it. Um, circling back, look, guys, the first four of these that I mentioned, meaning the AICPA, the State Board, and the IRS, I mean, these are really standards that you have, that you have to operate by. They're not necessarily the rules of accounting, okay? They're standards, professional standards. Um, and they address the failures for following those standards. The Internal Revenue Code that I mentioned, look, those aren't standards, those are actual rules. If you don't do this, you're gonna get hit with this penalty, okay? It's not a standard, it's a fact, it's a rule. Circling back to the AICPA, look guys, I mean, if and when you become CPAs, you may choose to become part of the AICPA. You don't have to, it's not a requirement. Um, the AICPA is basically, um, I'll say the gold standard for CPAs. You are voluntarily submitting yourself to the highest level of standards in the accounting profession is what you're doing when you join the AICPA. You're saying to your clients, to whomever, I belong to the AICPA, I am voluntarily subjecting myself not just to my state level requirements, but I'm going a step above and beyond that, okay? I am going to the highest level of profession. That's what the AICPA is, you know, sort of engaging in. Um, they, the AICPA themselves, look, they don't create the accounting rules. There's some confusion about who does what. They don't create the accounting rules, right? That's done by FASB. FASB issues GAP. You guys have been studying GAP for a couple of years now. That's done by FASB, okay? The AICPA does issue standards, though, as I've been saying. Um, so for auditors, right, they issue the gas rules, the generally accepted auditing standards. For tax accountants, they issue these SSTSs, these statements on standards of tax services. And they also have the code of professional conduct. And again, those are more behavioral standards. Um, the AICPA administers the CPA exam, okay? You will see that as well. They basically write and administer the exam. They don't give you your license stuff. Okay, that's not done with the AICPA. Um, and really, overall, guys, the AICPA, what they try to do is try to bring a certain amount of cohesiveness among the states. Every state has their own accounting rules. Um, and what they truly try to do is kind of unify those rules and make sure that we're not running off in 50 different directions. Um, they try to be mediary and try to bring together some of the rules so it's not so crazy. Um, what can the AICPA do if you don't follow your rules? They can censure you. And censure basically means that they're going to put you on the naughty list. They're going to publish your name on the list and say, you know, Joe Smith didn't follow, you know, the AICPA rules, and they publish it and they send it out for, you know, kind of publication. It's an embarrassment. They're, they're embarrassing you. 
they're going to censure him. Um, they could suspend you temporarily. They could say, you know, you can't be part of the ASCPA for the next six months until you maybe take some training classes and do this, that, and the other thing. And then maybe we'll let you back in. Or they could suspend you altogether. You can no longer be a part of the ASCPA. Um, this is not a good thing by any means. It doesn't look good for your license. It doesn't look good for your career. But it's probably not the worst thing that can happen to you either. Okay. Um, doesn't look good. I'm not joining anyone violating their ASCPA rules. Um, but again, it's probably not the worst thing in the world. Okay. Um, the state board, state board, look, guys, their rules follow usually very closely the ASCPA rules, but states do have their own rules and you have to follow them. They are the ones, after you take your CPA exam, who will grant you your license. Okay. They are also the only body that can take away your license. Only the state board can do that. The ASCPA, the IRS, no one else can do that. Only your state board can take away your license. Um, in addition to taking away your license, they can do the same things. They can censure you, they can suspend you, okay? But they are powerful in the fact that they will take away your license. And if you get your license taken away, then you are in big trouble. That is a bad thing, okay? This is definitely worse than the AICPA. <coughs> suspending you or even taking you out. Um, I mentioned the IRS Circular 230. Um, this really talks about the IRS has its own rules dealing specifically with tax practitioners now. Um, that deal with who can come before us and practice before us, okay? Generally, guys, it's CPAs, attorneys, certain enrolled agents, um, but even people who aren't CPAs are allowed a limited amount of practice in front of the IRS, meaning you can prepare returns, you can sign returns. You can't do things like if your client's in an appeal, you can't go into an appeal with them, okay? You can't go into an exam with them and represent them there, only if you're a CPA, only if you're an attorney. Um, so you're much more limited if you're a non-CPA in what you can do. But you can do a certain amount without having your CPI before the IRS. Okay? That's uh, talked about in the Part A of the Circular 230. Part B of the Circular 230 deals, again, with these professional standards. Here's the you know, behaviors you must engage in to stay in good standing. And Part C gets into the penalties for not doing so. And it's generally the same stuff, censure, suspend, um, you know, expel you. And again, if you get expelled from practice before the IRS, you might as well kiss your career goodbye, okay? It's because now you can't even really prepare tax returns. Um, you're done. So that's not a good thing. Um, and I think they also have the power to charge certain nominal sort of monetary penalties. There's not a lot of them within the Circular 230, but they do exist. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, the Circular 230 Professional Standards, and your state board standards. I mean, it's things you would normally think of, you know, you have to use due care. Um, you have to be independent. Those, those are generally addressed more to auditors because, again, the AICPA isn't just dealing with tax professionals. They're dealing with auditors as well, you know, maintaining your independence. Um, talking about fees, you know, a lot of times you're not allowed to charge contingent fees. Um, you know, no discreditable acts, meaning, you know, oh, here I am, tax professional, and I'm sending all these tax returns in. Oh, by the way, I have filed my own tax return. Um, you know, you get charged for that. Well, again, you kind of push your license goodbye. They're going to discredit you, uh, you know, by the IRS. Um, advertising, they, all three of these are very strict about the type of advertising you can do. You know, obviously, you can't be out there promising, I'll get you, you know, 500 hours back on your tax return. You can't do that sort of stuff. So they're very strict about the types of advertising you can engage in. Those are sort of the basic conduct standards. Um, the SSTSs are addressed by the AACPA specifically to tax professionals. And we'll take a walk through these because they are very important. Um, so if you actually flip to page 225, there's exhibit 211. Um, and it walks through the SSTSs and you will walk through those. Um, the first one deals with tax return positions, and I'll read a little bit of it, saying, a tax professional should comply with the standards, if any, imposed by the applicable tax authority. Keep in mind, guys, we're dealing with federal taxes, but you may be working with state taxes, you may be working with local taxes, okay? There's other tax authorities out there besides what we're dealing with. So, saying you have to follow theirs if they exist, okay? Um, when preparing or signing a tax return, if there is no written authority, um, then the tax professional may recommend a tax re return position or prepare or sign a return when she has good faith belief that the position has a realistic possibility of being sustained if challenged or 
if there is a regional basis and it is adequately disclosed, okay? So we just went through this process of gaining all of this authority, okay? Before you engage in a position that you're not sure of, you wanna go out and get all this authority. And we just spent a lot of time talking about authority and how about getting it. So the way I would always talk, guys, is that before you take a, a position on a return or a client's return, you have to have a certain amount of authority and a certain level of confidence in that authority. We were always taught that you know, a reasonable basis feels that, look, we feel that you have a 20% chance of being upheld if this went to you know, appeal or conflict. You, know? you engage in a transaction with the IRS, 20% confidence of the authority we have in our favor, you get by on it. Okay, That's reasonable basis. Realistic possibility, which is being quoted by the AICPA, they're saying, look, if you have 33% confidence, realistic possibility, then you're in good shape, okay? Then you've done your job and you're not gonna be in trouble, you wanna violate the rules. Or, alternatively, um, what they were saying is, you can have reasonable basis, which is lesser, but in that case, if you only have 20% confidence in your materials, then you need to have disclosed this uh, when you were filing the return. There's actually a place where you can disclose um, the authority that you have. Look, we are reporting this position, somewhat questionable. Uh, we have authority, but you're making a plan. And now, obviously, most tax practitioners don't want to do that, guys, because what are you doing? You're setting up a big red flag, you know, before they even looked at your return, saying, hey, this is right for audit here. You know, they got a somewhat questionable position. Um, so most people will try to avoid this reasonable basis for disclosure. You usually want to go with out having disclosed it. And they're saying if you have realistic possibility, you don't have to go and disclose it. Much better for you. Okay. So what they're saying here, again, keep in mind, they're talking about all levels of taxing authorities. Um, they're saying if you have realistic possibility or you have reasonable basis and you disclose it, then you have done your job. Okay? Then you are not going to be subject to the penalty. I will point out in a minute that the federal code is much more strict than this, not much more, but they're more strict than this, okay? The federal code, and we'll show you on that page, says you need to have substantial authority, 40% confidence in your authority, or you can have the same reasonable basis and disclosure, okay? So the AICPA in this case is letting them off a little bit light. If you're gonna work with the IRS and the federal government, they're holding you to a higher standard. They're saying, nope, you need substantial authority. And if you don't have substantial authority and you don't disclose it, you're gonna be subject to penalties. The government will also, the federal government, will also allow you guys to get off the hook if you have what's called reasonable cause and good faith, okay? Meaning, it could mean a lot of different things, actually, but it could be something like, look, my client lied to me. I had no reason to know they were lying to me. I believe them. I've worked with them for years. Everything footed and tied. It all made sense. You know, this a good person. There's ways of getting out of it. You have to prove that you had reasonable cause for doing what you did and good faith. I didn't know. I honestly didn't know. And not just because I turned a blind eye and pretended not to know. I truly didn't know. Um, there are other ways of getting out, okay? There's always a reasonable cause and good faith exception. Um, but I will throw in here related to this SSTS is look, in addition guys, you're never supposed to take a position on a tax return of a client saying, look, you have a very, like, what I say, being in my class, you probably have a half a percent chance of being audited. You're never supposed to say to a client, like, we can go ahead and take this. I mean, chances are you're going to get audited or like almost nothing. You're never, ever, ever supposed to recommend a position based on the chances of getting audited. You're only supposed to recommend a position after you've done the appropriate steps of researching authority, weighing the authority, and then determining, do I feel confident that based on my authority, you know, if we got into a conflict with the IRS, my outcome would be 40% in my favor, 33% in my favor, 20%. Again, it's not an exact science, guys, but you know, you'd have to justify this if you went into one of these situations, okay? But never, ever, ever say to a client, like, yeah, take the position, you're not gonna get out of it. That doesn't apply, and if you try to say that, you'll. That's a big, big, big bad thing to do, okay? Um, okay. Uh, SSTS number two, answering questions on returns. It's just basically saying that, look, you're supposed to, there's a lot of questions on a return. You are supposed to make every effort to answer all those questions and address them with the client. 
you're not supposed to just answer the ones that are advantageous and sort of ignore some of the other ones. You're not supposed to even just really answer them based on what you think you know of the client. You're really supposed to address them with the client and make every attempt to address all of the questions that you do. Um, uh, the third one, certain procedural aspects, deals with, look, uh, as a tax professional, as a tax accountant, you have to rely on what the client tells you. And if they're using a subcontractor to prepare their materials, you can rely on that person. We are not auditors, okay? We have a very different job than being an auditor, okay? If they're providing you with schedules and you don't have any reason to believe that these schedules are inaccurate or that the staff is incompetent, you can rely on it. It's not your job to audit it. Um, if, even if they're using a third party to provide you with information, as long as, again, you believe that they are competent and know their job, you don't have to audit it. It's not, not our responsibility. Presumably, the auditors have done that, right? If you know something is wrong, then you can't use it. Okay? If you suspect something is wrong, it's your job to start asking some questions. Um, but assuming all is well, you can go ahead and just use it. It's okay. Uh, use of estimates. Um, there's certain times, guys, that you know it's too expensive to get actual detailed information. So it is okay to use reasonable estimates. Um, what you are not supposed to do is make it look like it's not an estimate. So if you know a client gives you a schedule and you know they're rounding something to hundred thousand dollars, to make it look like it's not a real number, you're not supposed to go to the tax return and make it you know one hundred and one thousand dollars, three hundred fifty six dollars and seventy six cents. Um, don't make it look like it wasn't an estimate. But it is okay in general to use estimates. You know, maybe they lost some files. Maybe the building burned down and you know they lost all the invoices. Okay, it's okay to recreate and be reasonable. Uh, departure from a previously concluded administrative proceeding. Um, there's situations, uh, times where um, people have been told by the IRS you have to report a certain way. Maybe you went in and lost an appeal. Uh, it's okay the next year to file your tax return and take a different position, okay? You don't have to take the position you had to take in the previous year because you lost an appeal. Unless you had to sign what's called a binding agreement. Every now and then, you have to sign something binding that's saying you have to take this position for the next three years. Then you have to follow the previous rulings. But if you feel that, look, you know, they were wrong, you can go ahead and take a different position this year. You're not bound to the other position. Okay. Um, knowledge of an error, this is always a big one in ethics class. Um, if you find an error, okay, it is your job, it is your responsibility to notify your client that you found an error, okay, that they need to fix the error, and the consequences for not fixing the error. You're supposed to do all three of those things. Notify them of the error, that they have to fix the error, and the consequences of not fixing the error. Penalties. Um, it is not your job to notify the IRS. And you actually can't notify the IRS. Not allowed. Unless it's a situation where you're subpoenaed, okay? Then the courts are involved. Now, you don't have attorney uh, client privilege. Because tax accounts, there's no client privilege. Um, so if you're subpoenaed, that's a different story. Then you have to tell them, you know. Um, but if you simply find an error, you don't run and tell the IRS. But you do tell your client, you. Um, but if you tell a client that there's an error and they don't fix it, and it's probably you know maybe a big deal. They didn't file a tax return for the past five years, or you know they stopped reporting a whole lot of income. You know you have to seriously rethink the relationship with this client. Is it worth the fee? Is it worth the trouble you're getting? You know about to get yourself into? Because now you have knowledge of what this client is about. Okay. Again, even if it's a situation where they haven't reported income in you know five ten years, and it's pretty serious. Can't tell the IRS, but now it's your, you know, you have to think about whether or not you want to continue this relationship at your own peril. Okay. Um, the last one is sort of a general, more ethical. Look, um, I mean, it's just basically saying if you've been working with a client and maybe there's been some changes in the tax laws, it's not your job to go back and notify them every time there's a change in the law that maybe affects something you had previously reported two years ago. If it's a planning engagement that you're involved in and you're working with them and the law changes, well, that's a little bit different because it's an ongoing sort of engagement. And yes, you do need to notify them in that situation. Uh, but this is just basically saying you're not on the hook to notify them every time something changes after you've done something for them. Okay. Um, so those are the statements I'm saying.
those are actually pretty important, guys. Um, again, these are the AICPA standards. These are the highest standards. And as an accountant, these are the standards you have to follow unless your federal government, your state, your local government has different standards. Then you have to follow those. And you have to follow the more strict of the two, okay? Um, so, sort of after that, we went through the Circular 230. Um, what I will tell you is that, look, those are sort of the professional standards. Then we get into the code, okay? Um, and I mentioned that the code doesn't really deal with behavioral standards. The code is just going to impose penalties, okay? And they have civil, uh, civil penalties and criminal penalties. And if you look at the example of the exhibit on page 212, uh, sorry, exhibit 212, page 227, this is a listing of different civil penalties. Um, and they're just pretty cut and dry. If you know if this happens, you're gonna get charged with this penalty. It's not a whole trial jury sort of thing. Um, the first penalties, if you look to the right, we're talking about the tax practitioner penalties. Um, the first half of the page where they all start with failure to. Um, that's code section 6695, you don't need to know that. Um, and these are all sort of small little penalties, like failing to keep copies of the client's returns, failing to sign the client's returns, failing to get the client copies of their returns, I mean, little things. It's $50, if they come in and audit your office and you're found in violation of these rules, it's $50 per instance. So every return that's missing, $50. Every time you didn't sign one, $50. Um, they're capped usually at $25,000 in total. Um, and there's always, again, guys, there's almost always a reasonable cause and good faith inception. My office burned out last year. All the files were in it. Okay? That's going to be reasonable cause and good faith. Um, the bigger one that I mentioned earlier is code section 6694 that sort of corresponds with SSTS number one is this understatement penalty. Okay? If your client is found to have an understatement on their tax returns, they impose these penalties greater of $1,000 or 50% of the income you earn on the client engagement, okay? Um, and this is the rule where I was talking about that if you have, on the federal level, substantial authority, or you have reasonable basis and disclosure, or of course, reasonable cause of good faith, um, then you won't be subject to a penalty. So circling back, guys, this is where your all your tax research, knowing your tax authority, really pays off. Because the fact is, is you might report something on your client's return, uh, you may go into an appeal with the IRS, you may lose, and the IRS may say, look, you owe this money, you lost the case. But as long as you have the substantial authority or reasonable basis and disclosure or reasonable cause and good faith on the federal level I'm talking now, then you may still have to pay the tax assessment where they disagree with you, but you don't have to pay this penalty. You can get out of the penalties. You're protecting yourself, okay? Um, and again, this is where it starts with understatement due to unreasonable position. That's code section 6694, they mention it in the book. Um, this is sort of what I'm gonna say is the equivalent to the SSTS number one, okay? Before you take a position on return, know what sort of authority you have behind you. And if you know and you have the right level of authority, you're gonna escape these penalties, these civil penalties. Um, on the flip side of the page, guys, they're also showing that not just do tax practitioners have these penalties, but the taxpayers themselves with these penalties, okay? Because sometimes we are complicit in our own sort, even though you pass it off to a tax account and maybe you didn't tell them all the information, maybe you didn't supply them with the right documents. So we too are subject to these penalties and any of you who file returns probably know this. Um, we've already loosely talked about these failure to file, failure to pay tax returns. These are the first two. That's code section 6651. Again, you don't need to know the numbers. Um, those are civil penalties. Um, the next one down, failure to make estimated payments. We'll learn about later in the state uh, the semester. Um, and then the next one is substantial understatement. Well, this is code section 6662. This is the counterpart, okay, to the tax practitioner's understatement penalty. Kind of what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Okay? If there's an understatement on your return, not just as your tax practitioner going to be responsible, but you are as well. Okay? And generally, if you have those same authorities, you'll get out of the penalty. Okay? Um, okay. So look, guys, I mean, in addition to these civil penalties, you guys aren't really going to be held accountable to no individual penalties. Um, but just understand the authorities and how you can escape them. Okay? 
Uh, but in addition to these civil penalties, guys, look, they do have criminal penalties. You've all heard these. They're very uncommon, but you know we hear about them in the headlines. Um, they're popular. Everyone knows Al Capone. They couldn't get him on all the murder charges, but they finally got him for tax evasion, right? Um, more recently, for any Bravo fans, um, Teresa Giudice uh, went to jail last year. The Real Housewives of New Jersey. No fan. <laughs> I am. Don't tell anyone. My husband makes fun of me endlessly for it. Um, she went to jail. Her and her husband's going to go to jail when she gets out for this tax evasion. They commit fraud. They filed all sorts of false W-2s and things of that nature. Um, they got them for bankruptcy fraud, but they also got them for tax um, tax fraud. Um, that's the case where there's jail time involved. So you know, you start messing around with your taxes. It's not just monetary penalties, but potentially there is criminal penalties. Okay, rare. Um, Another one is uh, he hasn't gone to jail yet, but my guess is he will. Um, Jersey Shore fans like the situation. Uh, like, uh, the situation. I didn't watch that one. Um, he's getting ready to probably face some jail time himself. He's right now still working through the court system, but he, um, from what I have read, is like uh, evaded taxes by more than nine million dollars over the course of three, four, five years, something like that. So he more than likely will be seeing some jail time himself. Again, these are for the more serious cases, guys. These are willful cases where you knew what you were doing and you went out of your way to do it. It's willful, okay? It's not just simple neglect, you know, it's careless, and stupid. Um, these are really where there was intent okay? And they will go after these guys and they will make examples of them. Um, and they will get jail time. Uh, Wesley Snipes was another one. I think Lauren Hill had some jail time. I mean, they're out there, it does happen. So, um, those are the more extreme cases. That's it, guys. Um, that's chapter one and two.